great. I'm ready to have a great afternoon. Um, thank you, Marie, and thank you, Tim, for having me here today. Um, I'm really excited. I just have to say that was incredible to see basically the entire room stand up. So how awesome was that? Um, so listen, I'm going to tell you about a dinner that I went to recently that left me feeling really angry. And it didn't start out that way. I wasn't planning for that kind of night. Um, it was actually dinner out at a restaurant with friends, you know, great food. I was drinking tequila. I have two children, so that happens. And as, the, as we got into the conversation and we were having great conversation, I decided it might be a good opportunity to ask my friends their advice about something that we struggle with in our work. And that's how could we do a better job convincing people that homelessness is a solvable problem, right? And so they were up for it, they were game, and we started having the conversation. And as we got into the conversation, the tone of the conversation, the types of stories people were telling, started making me feel really angry. So I sat back and tried to figure out, why is it making me feel this way? And I realized that the conversation felt a lot like a conversation that I used to have around the dinner table with my family. My parents are fairly conservative. And so when we would start to talk about politics or social issues and I would offer my ideas about how, how I think we would solve those problems, often those ideas were seen as naive or impractical, right? I don't know if this ever happened to you. It's just so frustrating. And that's how it felt at dinner with my friends, like, like my ideas were naive, that this wasn't a solvable problem. And I'll be honest, that is how I see myself in the world. I am a problem solver. And that is how I want other people to see me. So I left that dinner feeling frustrated and angry, and I've thought a lot about it. And what I wondered is if the reason that I can't convince even people I know, and that we can't convince people that homelessness is a solvable problem, is maybe because we don't believe it's a solvable problem. Because if we did, would we set up our work in the way that we have? And I don't think we would. I think it would look different. So, I'd love to share with you today what I think we'd do if we were gonna treat homelessness as a solvable problem and the things we'd have to shift. So there's three things we'd do. First, we'd shift from charity to problem solving. Second, we'd shift from seeing this as a technical problem to start seeing it as a complex problem. And the last thing is we'd move from having static data to having dynamic data. So the first thing, moving from charity to problem solving. So charity is accepting any activity associated with helping a homeless person as sufficient, right? And problem solving is us demanding that the activities associated with ending homelessness are part of a system that is intentionally designed to get us to the goal of ending homelessness in our community. I'm gonna give you an example, and it, it may be an extreme one, but I, I think it's a good one. So my office is in Skid Row in Los Angeles, and if you're not familiar with Skid Row, it's 50 city blocks in downtown Los Angeles that is a result of failed public policy. So decades ago, city leaders decided if you're a person experiencing homelessness and you wanted to access services in Los Angeles, they would all be concentrated in this area of Los Angeles. So if you need emergency housing, a meal, clothing, healthcare, mental health care, it's all here, right? And so what that has resulted in is thousands and thousands of unsheltered and sheltered folks all concentrated in this very small area. And so if you were to walk the streets of Skid Row, what you would see is block after block of tents and cardboard boxes and trash piled up. And you'd see really, really vulnerable people living on the street. And you'd just be shocked. You can't believe you're in America when you see it, right? And it's in this context, in this place, that every year there is the Skid Row Carnival of Love. And it is a literal carnival. There are jugglers, there is face painting, right? There are free hugs. There are people handing out clothing and meals, right? And I don't have any, any problem with people being kinder to each other in Los Angeles. 
right? We probably need that. And especially being kinder to people who are experiencing homelessness. But you have an area of downtown LA that looks like the aftermath of a hurricane, and instead of setting up a command center and sending in FEMA, we have a carnival of love. So this may feel like an extreme example of charity, right? We can all kind of agree that sounds crazy. It is. And so let me give you a less obvious example of charity. So I started this work um, in, in permanent supportive housing. I managed a 400 unit permanent supportive housing building in Manhattan for five years. And I took that work very seriously. We had great on-site services. We had a great property management team. We had 95% retention rate, right? And if you asked me during those five, five years, are you ending homelessness, I would have said yes. And the truth is, when I look back on that work, I wasn't ending homelessness. I was resolving homelessness for the individuals who were lucky enough to get into my program, lucky enough to get onto my wait list. But was I part of a system in New York that was dedicated and focused on ending homelessness? The answer is no. And what would it look like if I had been? Well, first, all of us doing this work in New York would have had to first agree we were gonna end it, right? and what it looked like when we got there, and that that end state was clear and measurable, and we knew what it looked like across the whole community to end homelessness. And we all would have had to be able to get into a room and look at what each of our programs were doing and see if the work of each program was getting us closer to less homeless people this month than we had last month. And if it wasn't, all of us would have had to be prepared to change what we were doing, right? To stop doing some things, to start doing other things to give up resources, to get new resources, we would have had to be prepared to do that. It's coordinated access, right? It's all what we're talking about now. That's what it looks like. But that system and those activities within it, they are only as good as if they get us to the end state, to the goal. Are we ending homelessness across our community or not? So that's what it would look like to move from charity to problem solving, to know that and demand that in our work. The next thing we would do is move from seeing this as a technical problem to seeing it as a complex problem. So a technical problem is like baking a pie, right? Follow a recipe, you're gonna get a reliable result. Unless you're a really bad baker, I am. But generally most people are gonna get a reliable result. Complex problems are like raising kids. I have two kids. Folks have kids in the room? Parents? Yeah? Okay. Raising kids is a complex problem. My two kids, Van and Sienna, they are very different people. They both require different things, and what they require is always changing. And just when I think I figured it out, right, just when Sienna is sleeping through the night, then she's not, and I've got to try a new strategy and figure out a new approach and see if that works instead, right? That's the homelessness. It's always changing. The problem is always changing. And there are definitely some things we have figured out, right? We have figured out housing first. We know what that looks like when you do it well. But housing first in and of itself is not sufficient to get us to an end to homelessness across our whole community. It ends homelessness for an individual, but it's not what it looks like if we're treating this like a complex problem. It's not enough. So let me tell you the story of an effort that got dramatically different results when they shifted from treating the problem as a technical problem to treating it as a complex problem. And that's the global eradication of smallpox. Listen, I lead an effort that is dedicated to getting to zero on homelessness, right? And there aren't many examples when you look around of efforts that have gotten to zero on anything. And so when we find with some, we get really interested in what they learned and what happened. And so when you look at global eradication of smallpox, it's really interesting. We had a vaccine since the 1800s for smallpox. It wasn't until almost 200 years later, 1977, that we got to global eradication of smallpox. So what changed? What had to change over that time to make that possible? Well, there are three key things that changed. The first one was the technology did get better. The way that the vaccine was being administered got more reliable and faster, right? That was important. 
And the second thing that changed is with the creation of the UN and the WHO, there was a body that could own that goal and be accountable for it and bring the resources to bear. So that was critical. But it was still 30 years until the end of it. So what changed? And it was their strategy. So at the beginning, they had a strategy of mass vaccination. Let's just get the vaccine out to the whole world. Can you imagine being on that team who has that goal? You have to vaccinate the entire global population, right? And to their credit, they were doing a great job. Right? They had vaccinated more people globally than we'd ever seen in the history of the world. And when they looked at the data, you know what was happening? The numbers of people with smallpox was still increasing. Imagine how frustrating that is. Here you are, this huge undertaking, and the numbers aren't moving. And so what was the problem? The problem was they were getting the vaccine to everyone, but they weren't getting it to the people who needed it. And when they started figuring out how to get the vaccine to the places that needed it quickly is when they started to make the change. So when they had real-time data to know when an outbreak happened and to get a team of people there quickly to vaccinate all the people who were at, biggest, at highest risk of getting smallpox around that central point of outbreak, and then using the data, data to learn quickly and try to predict when the next outbreak would happen is when they started seeing a shift and when they were able to get to zero on smallpox. And so I think there's a lot we can learn from this, right? We see housing as our vaccine. If we just get housing to everyone, we'll figure out how to solve it. And just like the teams in smallpox, it isn't enough, right? Those teams were not just experts in the disease. They were not just experts in how to administer the vaccine. They had to have a new problem-solving toolkit if they were going to get to that goal. So what does that require of us? We need to have data scientists who can look at patterns and trends and analyze the data for us. We have to be experts in the data, right? We have to have people who are great at running small tests of change, knowing when a change is an improvement, looking at new strategies, trying them, shifting when it's not working, and knowing how to scale what is working when we figure it out. That's quality improvement. We need people who are great at bringing small and large groups of people together to change their behavior, right? That's great facilitation. And if we are going to shift from seeing this as a technical problem to seeing it as a complex problem, we have to invest as deeply in building those skill sets and bringing those experts into our field as we do in our teams having excellent technical ability and things like housing first and great outreach skills and diversion. Right? Those are really important. But it's not enough. We have to have teams with these other skills. And we have to dedicate the space for those people to do that work and the structures for them to do it within. We can't ask someone to run a permanent supportive housing project and be excellent at housing first and then figure out large scale change in their spare time. Right? We're going to burn people out if we don't figure out how to separate the innovation from the execution and bring on the skills that we need to start treating this like a complex problem. So, we've decided to move away from charity to problem solving. And with a clear, measurable end state of what it looks like to end homelessness across our community. And we've decided to move away from treating this as a technical problem to treating it as a complex problem by building the teams with the skills that we need. So, the last thing we need is real-time data, right? To know if what we are doing is actually working or not. And that's moving from static data to dynamic data. And I, let me tell you something. We are not going to end homelessness in any community without it. We're not going to end it across a country without it. And I'll tell you why I know that, because I spent a year failing hard here. And I'd love to tell you that story, because everyone loves a good failure story, and I've got them. So I'll share, share, I'll share at least one with you. There's plenty more. So this is a picture of, of our team, early 2015. We seem so happy. We have a plan. 
We've just launched a national effort to work with 70 communities to end veteran and chronic homelessness. We talk about ambitious goals, we decide in the first year, all 70 are gonna to get to an end to veteran homelessness. And our strategy for how we're gonna do that is we are gonna use the annual point in time data that communities collect during a couple days in January to figure out your, their census on how many people are homeless, as well as some extrapolations around inflow and housing placements to figure out what would it look like for each of our communities to end veteran homelessness. How many people would they need to house every month over the course of 12 months if at the end of those 12 months they were gonna to get to zero on veteran homelessness. So we do this for every single community. People create pictures like this in every single community we're working with of their goal. How many people do we have to place in these 12 months if we're gonna to get to the goal, right? We did it for the whole initiative, 75,000. And so people start doing that work and they're being successful and the majority of our communities are hitting their targets. I just, I looked back and I had actually written in the board, my board report how proud we were of the success we were having, right? And by the end of that year, with a goal of 70 communities having ended veteran homelessness, do you know how many did? One. And I'm the leader of that effort, right? And so, what went wrong? What was the problem? Well, the problem was, we were using static data that looked at homelessness at one point in time in January to try to understand what we were supposed to do all year long for a problem that is complex and dynamic and changes all the time. And you know this, right? Homelessness looks different all the time in your communities. These are human beings moving in and out of homelessness, and it looks different in July than it looks like in January, and we weren't paying attention to any of that. We were just looking at this snap, snap, snapshot of data and trying to make it work for us. And it didn't, right? And it took us 11 months to figure it out. It wasn't until the end of the year that we were like, oh, crap, it didn't work, right? But we have a growth mindset, and so we moved forward, and we decided that, listen, lesson learned. We're not going to make this mistake again. Every single one of our communities has to have person-specific, by name, real-time data, right? They have to understand this problem in real time. And so every one of our communities undertook to get that kind of information. And what that information gave them were two key things. The first is to understand the dynamics of that problem. How many people are coming into our system every single month? How many people are homeless in front of us today? How many people are exiting? and really understand what's happening. It's different in every single place. And it's unpredictable. But we can at least watch it and understand it. So that's one thing. But then the second thing it gets you is the ability to know, as you look at that data over time, are we making the progress we think we are? Are we getting to that end state that we agreed we're going to get to, which is an end to homelessness across our community? Do we have less homeless people this month than we did last month? And the, if the answer is no, then are we willing to take a hard look at what we're doing and change that? So our communities now have this, and this is what it looks like for a community. One of the things you'll learn about me is that I love run charts. I'm a data geek. This chart makes me very happy. This is Chicago. This is, the, the blue line is the number of homeless veterans they have in their community. And when they got by name data, they had about 900 homeless veterans in their community. And they use that real-time data to bring their team together on a weekly basis, monthly basis, look at what they were doing, see if they were making the progress they thought they were making, and change strategy as they went. And what it's resulted in is their ability to show you that over the last year and a, year and a half, they have driven down the number, reliably driven down the number of homeless veterans in their community. And it's powerful to see it this way. And there's certainly, all the charts don't look like this, right? If you look at them for our communities, sometimes they start to go up and you figure out, okay, what's happening and you've got to course correct and figure out something different. But Chicago's making incredible, incredible progress. But that real-time data has given them something else, a look at their inflow in a new way, right? And what they found when they look at their inflow is they have 100 new veterans coming into the system every month. And they haven't been able to bend that curve, right? Even though they're reducing homelessness every month, they're doing it without touching inflow. 
And here's the hypothesis. Chicago's not going to be able to go from 500, which they're at now, to 100 if they don't figure out inflow. And I think that lesson is a lesson for all of us, right? This data is telling us we have to figure out how to start to work effectively upstream to figure out how we reduce inflow. And we have the ability with real-time data to do it differently. Because Chicago can look at, OK, who's come into the system in the last two or three months? What are their characteristics? Are there systems upstream that they're touching? Are there trends in that? Could we target one hospital or one partner and do some process improvement with them and see this needle move? Could we make inflow an outcome measure for the upstream systems? but do it in a way that isn't just pointing fingers at the stru structural problems upstream, but is really targeted and brings in new partners, and we use the data to drive those results. And this, I think, is the future of our work. We have to figure out this part and put just as much energy into this as we have in figuring out how to get better at housing people. And that is so exciting to me, right? Because we wouldn't have got here without the real-time data, and what else can we learn as we all start to have that kind of information in our communities to help us get to the goal of ending homelessness? So as I said before, right, the reason I do this is because I am a problem solver. And I want to solve this problem. I want to be on the team that does that. I want to be on that team with you, right? You guys have committed to it, and I'm in. I want to solve this problem with you. And here's the good news. We're doing it. There are 10 communities that we work with that have ended veteran or chronic homelessness. This is one of them. This is Gulf Coast. They were our first community to get to an end to veteran homelessness. And that, we've celebrated that, and that is exciting. But when you look at this chart, which is, again, their number of veterans over time, what's exciting to me is not that they ended it, but that they've sustained it, right? That's still the thing. Like, can we hold these gains over time? And because they look at this information every week and they're dedicated to this goal, they are sustaining it. And they're getting it down to even a hard zero, which we feel just so excited about. So here's my dream. And listen, it is a geeky dream, but it's my dream. My dream is that there is a chart like this for every single community, right? And the next time I am at some stupid dinner where I can't convince the people in front of me that we can end homelessness, I can just pull out my phone, scroll to the city, whatever city I'm in, and show them the run chart. It shows the progress that that community is making and that we are all making in getting to this goal of ending homelessness across our communities. Because homelessness is a solvable problem and we are going to be the people to do it. Thank you. <laughs>